Hello, everyone. It's really nice to welcome you for this uh, afternoon's lunchtime talk uh, um, as part of the Forest School lunchtime talk series. It's um, we have two wonderful speakers today, which will I include shortly. And the theme of today's session is, if I get my computer to work, is forest wilding. Um, the maybe more broadly about the series. Um, um, I'm Andreas Lang. I'm sorry, I'm kind of a, a bit all over the place today. I'm Andreas Lang. I'm the course leader of the MA in Architecture at Central St. Martins, and I'm also the lead for placemaking across Central St. Martins, which is an art school in central London. And over the last year, we've been working in different partnerships into the idea of what would it be like if uh, design education starts within a living system, for example, a forest. So we've collected um projects and practices and uh talks uh, around this um theme and the forest talks are a kind of crucial moment where we bring some of the newly found friends and experts uh, together for a dialogue often they're outside uh, uh experts that come in and we pair them up with speakers from our network from designers or artists within the school um the talks don't always relate to architecture, but they relate to this larger idea of how we work in empathy with living systems. And for us, it's also a chance to build a bigger case towards the school, towards the college, to adopt this practice uh, more globally across the school. So it's really a, a nice movement that's starting through the forest talks, and I'm really pleased um, to host our two speakers here today. The theme is forest wilding. Uh, the session was initially called rewilding, but the more we thought about the term, the more uh, we moved away from it. And forest wilding, as Andrew Stringer will present later, is a term used within Forestry England. Um, so let me go to the next slide. Oops. Um, I jump my slides, introduce the speakers, and go a little bit backwards. So today with us uh, is Andrew Stringer, Head of Environment at Forestry England. This current series of four talks always uh, brings to the table uh, a speaker from Forestry England. And, oh, Heather, I misspelled your name. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm going to move on very quickly. But Heather Barnett is an artist, uh, course leader, no, uh, stage leader at um, the MA Art and Science, and also a member of the Living Systems Lab. She has many different hats on. And she will speak mainly about her own practice. Um, but uh, also maybe good for you to know that it's also part of this uh, idea of working with living systems. Um, a quick shout out to our supporters. Um, we are doing this in partnership, of course, with Forestry England and uh, White Architecture in Malmö, which is an ongoing collaboration around similar themes. So it's really, I'm really pleased about the support and the growing partnership with uh, both organizations. So maybe one thing to quickly point out, these talks are recorded, as you've noticed, and we have a growing resource, which is a website, which you see here, which you can access where the talks and other projects that happen around that space are collected. And also we have a mailing list. So if you want to keep informed, please uh, join up, uh, sign up, and we will not spam you, but we will just send you interesting um, links every once in a while about these talks. So um, this is us without further ado. Uh, uh, maybe one more thing to mention that next talk is next week uh, with, um, <laughs> one second, can't read that. I don't wanna mess up the name because it's with Matteo Hernandez Schmidt. Um, and initially Matteo wanted to join this session. Uh, he's a Colombian environmentalist and has a very different take on um, rewilding and works for the last 40 or 30 or 40 years quite closely with the rainforest and reintroducing um, species that uh, native species into into yeah, the area. Sadly, he can't be here today, but tune in next week at the same time, which will be in some way a continuation of that talk. So without further ado, I hand over to Andrew, and then uh, after Andrew spoke for 10-15 minutes, we will 
uh, invite Heather and there's time for questions in between and afterwards. So thank you both so much for being here and um, over to you, Andrew. Perfect. Uh, many thanks for this. Let me just share my screen one sec. Great. Can you just confirm that's coming through? Okay. Wonderful. Right, same. Close to Great. So um, I'm Andrew Stringer. I'm head of environment at Forestry England. So I'm the strategic lead for nature recovery uh, within Forestry. Worth mentioning who Forestry England are if you've not heard of us. We are the organisation, uh, the public organisation that looks after the nation's forest, so the publicly owned forest. We're the largest land manager in England, managing roughly two percent. Of the landscape. Um, we uh, have quite a clumpy distribution of forests across England, but 99% of people live within an hour's drive. So for instance, we manage the new forests down uh, on the south coast, the Forest of Dean at the top of the Severn Estuary, uh, Thetford Forest over in East Anglia, and uh, Dolby Forest up in the North Yorkshire Moors, and Kielder Forest up at the borders. Um, and our closest woodland to central London is probably Thames Chase, so the the, the, the forest centre there out towards us. So we look after the nation's forests for people, for nature and the economy. So nature really one of the key uh, kind of pillars of our approach. Just moving on. I'm the strategic lead for nature recovery. I'm going to talk today about forest wilding, but we'll just put putting, putting uh, nature recovery into context because we are in the midst of a biodiversity crisis. So when I talk about biodiversity, I'm simply meaning biological diversity, the diversity of species. And on a biodiversity intactness index, uh, England came out 189th out of 218 countries. So it's thought that we just have 47% of our original biodiversity remaining. What does that mean? If this is a representation of a fully intact, fully functioning ecosystem with all species present, a pristine ecosystem, then ours is much reduced. We're both missing species as well as many species much, um, uh, much reduced in their population. So this is what we mean when we say that, that, that on a biodiversity intactness index, we've only got 47% remaining. And the best uh, kind of expression of this in our day-to-day -day lives is most obviously seen on our number plates. So when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, uh, number plates will be covered in bugs and now much reduced and all those bugs are really the basis of an ecosystem think of all the birds and species that feed on those so that's just one representation of this, this pretty horrendous biodiversity decline that we've seen unfortunately from this pretty low point in england we're still in decline so a nice a review of all evidence that we have uh, by a variety of environmental organizations called, uh, 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 the state of nature report and that was last done in 2019, and that showed from this low point, 13% of species are still at immediate risk of extinction. So Forestry England, it's one of the key pillars of our approach, uh, nature restoration. We're probably doing better than the national average, but we're almost certainly still in decline. So this is some data on the left about uh, butterfly, woodland butterfly populations on, on, within the nation's forests versus woodland butterflies across England. And as you can see, still very much in decline. The fundamental takeaway from this, uh, from this crisis that we find ourselves in is that, unfortunately, our conservation efforts to date have failed in halting that overall biodiversity. So we need to be adventurous. We need a step change for nature restoration, uh, both across England and across the world. And at Forestry England, we're excited by this challenge and we want to uh, really push forward something called forest wilding, which is what the rest of my talk. Forest wilding has a very simple headline principle. These are going to be places of innovation to rebuild biodiversity to restore intact forests. So places of innovation because we need that step change, rebuilding biodiversity to be restoring biodiversity because that's our key goal. And the key mechanism is restoring natural process. And that's why I just wanted to highlight that forest wilding is not stepping away and doing this. It is it's quite heavily interventionist. And the reason that is, is because of a lack of natural process, they're either missing or much reduced. So it immediately begs the question, what are natural processes? So I'll talk about that. 
And the best example I've found of a, of a classic natural process is with uh, the humble avocado, which we all know and many of us love. Um, the avocado, fascinating species, obviously we grow uh, many millions, but in the wild, the wild tree that we originally cultivated avocados from, it's going extinct. It's slowly going extinct in the wild, and it's linked to talk next week. It's a South American tree. Um, essentially, what happens is avocados just build up at the bottom of uh, the parent tree. They don't really disperse. Some of them do, uh, uh, um, uh, grow into trees, but, but very low germination rates. They mostly just and the crucial reason that avocado trees are doing this now is that they're missing their seed disperser. This is a crucial missing natural process. They would have had a seed disperser that would have dispersed avocados across landscapes. And that seed disperser is a species called a dumpfer which has been missing from South America for approximately 25,000 years. We came into many areas of the world and caused the extinction of mega herbivores, so large herbivores, elephant-like creatures really across the world. So this is a crucial missing species from South America, and we're only still now feeling the ramifications of that loss, as we're going to lose avocados as a wild species and a variety of other figs and species, and heavy fruited species often, that are reliant on, on this missing species, something that is extremely difficult to reintroduce. So there's a classic example of a missing natural process that would be very difficult to restore. Andrew, sorry to yes. interrupt. Your sound sometimes goes in and out. It might... I don't know if it's me or if it's your microphone. Is that uh, the same same for others? Yeah, the mic drops occasionally. All right, it sometimes happens on Zoom. Let me just plug my headset in. Yeah, thank you so much. Sorry to interrupt. It works. Yeah, if you see. No. You have to say something? I cannot hear you, I'm afraid. I'm going to have to unplug my microphone. No, that's good. That's good. That's good. Uh, can you hear me? No. It's not working for some reason. Ooh. Okay, let's, let's try again. It's, it's, I mean, you're... And now I've lost my cursor. Oh, no. This is going disastrously. Ah, give me two minutes. Sorry, yeah. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, it, it sounds. It's yeah, it's fine. It, you sound a bit like you have a cold, but uh, or sore throat, but it's fine. Might be my speaker. Yeah. Andreas, could you come on stream, screen and just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Unfortunately, I can't hear you. I, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Excellent. Right, well, I'll crack on and just speak a bit louder. I hope that uh, my audio comes through okay. Talking about missing natural processes, and I have a second set of headphones. I've just realised. Disappears. Okay, apologies. No, no, now it's good. I'll crack on and finish as quick as I can. What are natural processes? So this is a crucial missing natural process. But natural processes are extremely varied. So we have everything from soil formation through to scrub encroachment within an open habitat, through to tree aging and tree death, through to things like herbivory and predation and seed dispersal, as I mentioned, as well as pollination and disturbance. Why are we missing natural processes? We're missing a whole variety of ecosystem engineers and keystone species. So what those terms mean, very simply, is species which have a wide range of impacts on a, on a forest environment. So in Europe, this is a figure where the top half of the uh, uh, figure in black are species that are extinct uh, from Europe, and in the bottom half, species that are much reduced. And this just shows the suite of species that would be present in a pristine ecosystem in Europe. And in, in the UK, we can add a whole variety more species like beavers, wildcats, pine martins, and a variety of eagles that are missing from our landscapes. 
Woodlands are often you're not yet colonised by poor dispersers, but fundamentally we're missing an awful lot of, of species that, uh, that would have been here present naturally. So why should we restore natural processes? I've talked about avocados as an example, and we have similar examples for the UK, but beavers are a great missing species, providing a missing natural process that's really essential for biodiversity. So this is a picture from the northwest coast of Scotland, a place called Mapdale, and um, beavers, uh, there was an official Scottish beaver trial there, beavers moved in, built a dam, and this creation of wetland habitat meant a huge influx of biodiversity because of the habitat that was created. So amphibian populations went wild, as well as invertebrate populations went really high because of the amount of deadwood in the system, because of this new habitat that beavers were creating. And beaver ponds are extraordinary. So beaver ponds slowly silt up over time and then move into a different habitat type. So they might become a beaver meadow where the, where the water's been drained. And because fungi have been lost from this system, tree encroachment, which need fungi to survive, often are very, is very slow to happen. So these can be extraordinary habitats which change through time, beaver ponds. And these beaver meadows, as they're called, can be brilliant for a variety of songbirds and crickets and the like. Predation is another crucial missing natural process. And a great example of the importance of predation is from the northwest coast of America, the Pacific Northwest, where sea otters uh, were much reduced. Sea otters prey on sea urchins. Sea urchins eat kelp forests. Very simple ecosystem. We nearly wiped out sea otters because of their wonderful pelts. This led to an explosion in their prey population, sea urchins, and this led to a real hammering of their natural habitat kelp forests. But when we re-established this predator, this naturally capped the abundance of sea urchins, which balanced the ecosystem, allowing that, 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 that plant community, the kelp forest, to re, uh, restore itself. So predators can limit population numbers crucially. So that's what missing natural processes are. Why should we restore them? The crucial question then is how do we restore them in sites on forestry England estate? And the best way to reinstate a process is to restore the species for the process that they provide. So for instance, all our cattle in the UK and in, in the world come from uh, uh, a, a wild forest cow called an aurochs. So in terms of their function in the ecosystem, the missing process they provide, by reinstating a wild cattle species, that reinstates that process. And we can do this for a whole variety of different species. For reintroducing dung beetles, for instance, for their impacts on soils, reintroducing pine martins, reintroducing wood ants, a crucial ecosystem engineers, just allowing space for natural processes to thrive, like by, by allowing more deadwood or by adding uh, fungi, for instance, to a system. Beavers I've talked about um, a lot, and beavers are a really exciting uh, keystone species. In the UK, we only have one, uh, sorry, in England, we only have one wild population of beavers in Devon and Cornwall, and the government is currently deciding on whether to allow us to reintroduce to more systems because of these wonderful impacts on damming and coppicing along watercourses and the positive impacts they subsequently have on, on biodiversity. They also cause a bit of chaos, so you need a robust management plan because they do build things like dams in inappropriate places. We're also reintroducing top predators like white-tailed eagles. So this is a project with the Royal Dennis Wildlife Foundation. We're reintroducing the fourth largest bird of prey in the world to the south coast of England onto the Isle of Wight, a really fantastic project. And what we would lovely love to see is, is white-tailed eagles linked all the way from the south coast up to their populations in Scotland. And pine martins are classic. Uh, forest predator that we would love to uh, reintroduce more widely, but we have populations currently in Kielder in Northern England, as well as the Forest of Dean. So one way is to, is to restore, reinstate the species. We can also accelerate natural processes that are already existing, such as by reducing, by a tree veteranization. So old trees are great for biodiversity because they're full of interesting rock holes, um, and we need to, we can accelerate uh, that process of veteranization by doing things like inoculating with fungi. And then finally, we can replicate. So we can simulate missing natural processes that we're never gonna reinstate um, in the short term. So things like elephants are not gonna come back 
to our, uh, our, lands, our landscapes very soon. But they are a crucial missing natural process that all our wildlife really depend on to open canopies, for instance, so we can step in and, and uh, manage forests in that way. So I'm going to stop there. I hope you managed to hear me, at least for some of that, and I hope it was interesting. Uh, more than happy to take any questions. Thank you, Andrew. Did you, can you hear us? I'm going to leave and rejoin and hope that my um, speakers work that way. Thank you. Maybe we hold um, questions for Andrew for a moment and maybe we hand over to, to Heather. Is that a good idea, Heather? Do you want to come in? Yeah, I can go straight away. I'm happy to, to wait if you want to take questions directly for um, Andrew, or do you want me to press on? I think it's nice if you press on and we kind of combine questions. I mean, Andrew is here, I mean, unless, unless there's a burning question from the audience, um, maybe you can just uh, unmute yourself and speak up. Andrew, can you hear us now? can indeed many apologies good we could hear hear it all so thank you so much for the presentation um i think there, were, there are no questions no, no immediate questions so maybe i open uh, i hand it over to you heather if that's okay okay great thank you thank very you. much and thank you andrew for for your talk really interesting and great to yeah, see that reintroduction of of beavers and see them in action at night time um and i think whilst i'm coming from very different perspective as, as an artist and uh, an academic, I think there are connections and synergies between our approaches and, and kind of aspirations. Um, so thank you for the invitation to take part in the Forest Talks. And I'm an artist working with living systems and imaging technologies. Um, I need to share screen, that would help, wouldn't it? Let me just manage Zoom. Da, da, da. Okay. Right. Now you should be able to see everything. Can you see? Yeah, we see both the screen and you. Okay. It's nice. Good. Right. Um, so I'm an artist working with living systems and imaging technologies. I'm uh, based at Central St. Martins, uh, teaching on the MA Art and Science, and I uh, co-lead the Art and Living Systems Lab Research Group, which is uh, an eclectic group comprising of artists, designers and architects working with living systems and systems thinking. My practice includes photography, film, sculpture, installation, but I also work with participatory uh, practices and public realm research, and a lot of my work is collaborative with, with organisms, with scientists, with, with public. And I'm interested in revealing the hidden properties and behaviours of natural systems. And exploring the capacity of imaging technologies to help us experience and understand those systems better across species and across scales. So I'm particularly interested in species that are defined as superorganisms, where there's a collective intelligence that emerges from interactions between many individuals. So whether they're slime mold um, cells or ant colonies or the interactions between the worms and the microbes in my compost bin. And today I'm going to share a few of these interspecies encounters um, and how I interact with these living systems as an artist. For those of you not familiar with slime molds, they're single-celled amoeba-like organism which creep around the forest floor feeding on rotten vegetation. So I imagine that Forestry England is full of many species of slime molds uh, doing their bit to kind of help break down the forest floor and digest and uh, kind of um, engage with those rotting trees. Um, they, it, it's difficult to know how to define a slime mold. They operate as a collective. So you have millions of nuclei sharing a cell membrane um, and the organism communicates as one through chemical signaling. They are curious and nomadic, always looking for new adventures here, escaping from one Petri dish uh, into another in my studio. And I create environments for them to navigate and I intervene 
as I capture their growth behaviours through time-lapse photography. So amplifying biological time allows the organism to reveal itself to us human viewers, because at a top speed of one centimetre an hour, slime mold growth is not really perceptible uh, to us without uh, some technological intervention. Here you can see some of the most interesting growth patterns occur when it's hungry and looking for food. Um, and there's lots of interesting things around slime mold around its kind of networking uh, behaviour and, and sort of network, network optimization. My studies form a practical inquiry, starting with questions. So, you know, interested in how, do, how does the slime mold navigate its terrain? Um, what happens when I introduce two genetically identical slime molds? How will they interact? Will they fuse and become one? So let's have a look here. I'll put some... So the supercell forms an integrated whole in the collective strategy, enables the slime mold to optimize networks and navigate efficiently and learn from its environment. And it, the, this organism is considered to have a primitive form of intelligence, but all without any sensory organs um, and without a brain. And many fields of research are asking myriad questions of this, of this simple yet complex organism. Another intelligent organism that I work with, um, which operates as a superorganism, is the ant colony. On an individual basis, ants are relatively simple with very few neurons compared to us humans. But collectively, they form a global intelligence, transmitting information through complex communication mechanisms and generating knowledge um, about their environment for the colony, and also that information can be passed down through generations. So some colonies will, you know, are known to exist for 30 years with a single queen producing uh, offspring, but the generations change uh, kind of seasonally. So I enjoy working in the field as well as the studio um, and observing these organisms in their natural habitat um, rather than extracting them out of the habitat for the studio. Um, and I create a series of interventions. So here I found a well-established ant nest. This is shot in, in La Jolla, Art and Ecology Residency in Spain. Um, and I was interested in how quickly ants would respond to, to an offering that I gave them. So I put some food down, different, um, some raisins and some bread, some soaked with honey, some dry, and then observed as the ants found the food, told their friends, uh, to come and get it and then navigate it and, and manage to collectively move it to the nest. I hadn't realised that the size might cause a little bit of a problem, um, but the ants worked together to break down the food um, and to get it safely into the nest. But you can see the population building up, you can see the, the trail formations, and this is just through individual ants uh, communicating uh, on a, on a you know, multiple interactions through those local local neighbours, and you know observing in the field uh, allows me to to understand to gain insights through observation, and intervening you know, allows me to 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 test those mechanisms and to understand them better. The field can be messy. Um, it's not a controlled environment. So I also work in the laboratory and take some experiments into a laboratory context. Um, and a lot of my work is done in collaboration with scientists. Um, here I was working with the Swarm Lab in New Jersey Institute of Technology, and they're um, working, it's a, a eclectic uh, interdisciplinary lab of scientists working uh, to explore swarm intelligence across species and systems, from slime molds and ants to humans and robots. Um, inspired by a scientific paper authored by one of the scientists, I set up an experimental system and invited um, a group of a critical mass of New Jersey pavement ants uh, to explore an arena and to identify food. So I was interested in how they would um, navigate a new terrain and how they would communicate what they found to others. So utilising their communication mechanism of pheromone, pheromone trail formation. And what you're beginning to see here is a film that's made up of 12,000 photographs taken over a three hour period, working with a thousand ants as they enter the arena. 
And rather than looking at the individual ants, I was interested in that global perspective, how trails were established over time within the group. So what you hear, what you see here is a composite of images showing the behavior of the mass. As territory is mapped and food sources found and lost and trails reformed. Everything you see here in white, except that very central dot is ant, the colony as an image making system. And working with imaging technologies and visualization software allows me to manipulate biological representations and play with time and with scale to reveal or to, or to conceal sometimes the processes of life to, to highlight or to distill. And the final section focuses on more recent observations of um, very local uh, species interactions in my small North London garden. Um, Inspired by staying at home a lot uh, when, the, when the pandemic hit, turning my attention to my locality um, and observing the interspecies interactions, capturing the processes of change and transformation at a, at a hyperlocal level. And there are stories from my garden, they're tales of opportunism and territorial battles, adaptation and resilience, uh, with many inventive evolutionary strategies observed along the way. Um, here you can see a giant pumpkin plant anchoring into the grass with these curly tendrils to secure its position and maximize territory covered. The compost bin that you can see in the background has also become a focal point to observe many of these interactions um, and this is a trigger warning if anyone doesn't like wiggly worms. So I observe the cycles of waste management as my food scraps are converted by the worms and the microbes into nutrient rich compost. And deep inside the compost bin, I discovered an ant colony had taken up residence, a very safe home with plentiful food supply. But this presented a conflict because I wanted to use the worm created compost to put on the garden to feed my plants, to provide me with food. Um, and in order to extract this resource, I needed to interact with the ant nest, the test of its resilience and rebuilding capabilities. The ants, meanwhile, are farming aphids on my bean plant. They keep the aphids in the nest over winter and when they've got, in, when spring comes and lots, there's lots of growth, they uh, place the aphids in a nutrient rich area, so in the buds of the, of the bean plant, um, thereby feeding the aphids and then the ants uh, feed off the, the kind of sweet secretions that the aphids produce. So it's a symbiotic arrangement between the ants and the aphids. But if I don't keep the aphid population down um, and keep that in check, the aphids will take over, the plants will be inhibited and I won't get any beans. So I encourage ladybirds to feed on the aphids and I occasionally intervene with a hose to keep the numbers down. These territorial negotiations are not just between me and my non-human garden inhabitants, they're evident within species, back to the giant pumpkin. So here we can see um, two enormous plants grew and took over six square meters of my garden. Let me just get back to that video. Um, but as the plants grew and fought over resources, only one pumpkin survived to reach maturity. You can see a rather sad looking slug eaten uh, second pumpkin in the background. Um, so that's a negotiation within the plant itself, putting all its energies into one fruit and sacrificing the other to maximize the resource. Um, and this battle for dominance would, be, would have been fought mostly underground as the plant's root systems and connected mycelial networks negotiated and decided which direction to put these vital resources. Okay, so these are stories of worms, ants, aphids and beans. They're small stories from a little garden. Different species negotiating with each other for a fair share of resource, establishing and protecting their habitats, working in collaboration or competition with other neighbouring species. But I'm complicit in these interactions. The worms help me manage my food waste, I feed them, and in return they produce compost, which feeds my plants, which in return feed me. Um, and observing and interacting with biodiversity in this way, 
I find is a form of thinking with the living systems in practice to understand those systems and understand how systems thinking is at play in my surrounding environment and to consider the relationships between biological networks across species and scales. But if we zoom out from my little compost bin and think on a planetary scale, we can learn much from these complex interspecies negotiations, um, what I'm calling compostulations. And they're not about persistent growth or natural capital. They embody reciprocity and balance, care and control, give and take, growth and decay. And I think, you know, we, through kind of artistic observation and interaction, um, I, you know, trying to think about myself kind of within this assemblage of, of species negotiation. Just to summarise, um, you know, I've shown you a range of projects working with different species, some employing sophisticated imaging technologies, some involving just sitting and watching. Um, but there are some overarching intentions and methods that connect and intersect across these different approaches. I'm trying to create interspecies encounters between intelligent life forms, so between humans and non-humans, employing imaging technologies to help mediate between species subjectivities to negotiate or mediate between our sense of time, our sense of scale, and creating situations or habitats that can reveal behaviours otherwise not easily seen by humans. Um, and often not seen because we choose to ignore them or they, they might be kind of out of scale, out of reach, but they might also just be out of our mind's eye. And whether in the studio, the laboratory or the field, my working materials are the inherent properties of those systems. And my aim is to draw attention to those behavioural complexities, uh, particularly those that operate socially and collectively. To also to lower our perceived hierarchy of species and to challenge our human exceptionalism. And to recognise that there are many different forms of intelligent life um, and they all need to coexist. So I'd just like to thank the ants and slime molds and other living things, including humans who've helped in the process of the inquiry and the labs with which I've worked. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heather. Um, that was great. Thank you both. And maybe we can uh, open the floor for questions and conversations. Um, Feel free to either unmute yourself or put questions into the chat, and I'm happy to read them out. Um, I can kick off with a question, um, maybe to, maybe to, I have a few thoughts in my head. Maybe I'll just say them all, and we can, you can decide which one to answer. First, first of all, I, I, I like this idea. Well, I'm an architect, so, so this term rebuilding um, biodiversity is, uh, you know, the term building is in them. When we spoke earlier, I wondered how maybe uh, art and design disciplines feature in this rebuilding or what role those can play beyond maybe the obvious of uh, coming to build a building, <laughs> but where this kind of expertise of the designer is encountered in, in the wilding process. And the other question was, um, when you said something about the otter building that dams in the wrong place or the beaver <laughs> and it's the wrong place for, for, for us, but it's probably the right place for them. And what, and maybe that also goes to Heather, what kind of relationships you build up with them and who's in charge and also who, if it's reciprocal, how much do they affect you? So if you simply observe them and then you become friends, your language is that of affection. Um, what do you get? What what do they get <laughs> in return? In a way, where's you know, where's are they just something you have to manage uh, through building and interventions, or is is there like a reciprocal dialogue um, within both Forestry England, but also within the art practice? I don't know who wants to. I don't know if oh, it was I'll a jump question. In, I, yeah, I could happily jump in to start with. Um, Great talk, Heather. I was fascinated by that. Slime molds immediately shot to the top of my favourite species now, you know, the, as I'll sit there for a good few weeks, I suspect. But I did have a quick look at our species database and we found 149 biological populations, but I'm sure there's many more. Species. Um, really interesting question. So in terms of rebuilding, yeah, and the crucial way, re reason we use that term rebuilding is because of that, if you imagine that, that, um, that infographic, of, that, in, that info about the food web that I used at the start, how we've lost so many species. And we need to rebuild because 
some species won't be appropriate to reintroduce because you've not put the building blocks in place. So a good example is we're currently looking at whether we can reintroduce golden eagles to England. And one of the key pushbacks on that is, is about golden eagle prey and how actually you need an abundance of lagomorphs, so they're the rabbits and the hares, for golden eagle populations to do well. And the places we might be looking to do golden eagle reintroduction, places like Kielder up in the northern England um, upland habitat, are missing uh, that whole community of, of hares and rabbits. So we need to rebuild the community by rebuilding the, the basing base box first. We might have to do a, a hair reintroduction to Kielder before we can do a top predator. So rebuilding, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting term. And you've asked a challenging question about that, that, that interdisciplinary nature of how we can get involved. But I think actually you answered it with the, with the beavers question. So um, beavers are fascinating. If there's one species we could reintroduce tomorrow that would have the biggest impact on rebuilding biodiversity with the beavers. And because they have such widespread impacts, um, they do cause an awful lot of impacts for, human, for, for people. And uh, they like it. nature loves a bit of chaos, and they cause a bit of chaos. So uh, in places like Norway and Sweden, where you've got abundant populations of beavers across landscapes, key areas of conflicts are often associated with flood, flood, uh, in flooding infrastructure, where you've got an embankment, and, uh, and they're tunneling into the embankment, and that's the embankment's collapsed but also roads and culverts. And that's quite interesting because they like these pinch points within a water course. So wherever the water is channeled or there's an easier place to build a dam that um, then, uh, then they love to build dams there because it's easier for them. But unfortunately that's probably the worst place for us because we've got a forest road, for instance, that we're trying to extract timber out of our forests or with products for, um, they might well build a dam along that road and then flood that road. So it's the worst place for us, but we've got the easiest place for them. So there's a real reciprocity there because we want to restore nature and accommodate beavers very much. And we're, we're planting species that they love, species like aspen and willow to encourage them in in future years. But we know that we're going to have to manage their impacts. And actually, when they build a dam in the wrong place, we might have to put, you know, things like you can put metal tubes through the dam so that so the water level doesn't get too high. Uh, so a real, real balance there. But I do wonder whether we could perhaps design our infrastructure better to accommodate beavers so that we you know if a beaver builds a, a, a dam and a culvert then it's not an issue perhaps you can live with it if you've got the right design uh that hopefully partially answers you yes thank you so um to recap on the question so it's around the idea of kind of building an intervention and then the relationship um so i guess i see my role as one of mediating it's sort of between species to you know i'm you know, i kind of see myself as a self-appointed spokesperson for the you know unsung heroes of the natural world you know slime molds are incredibly complex um organism and you know lots of people don't know very much about them um and you know the same with ants we 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 know we we know ants they're they're around us but the com the social complexity of of them as a, as a kind of organized community is is not always uh, well known um so the, yes the unsung heroes of of the natural world I, I, a self-appointed spokesperson and mediating you know, through visual language through storytelling and what i didn't show today is a lot of um, kind of participatory work. So I do a lot of collective experiments and you know, invite people to you know, processes of co-inquiry and, and field work, et cetera, which is also an important part of it. Um, and the relationship with the organisms, that's a complex one. And that's, you know, that changes over time. Um, you know, I used to, I used to talk about collaboration with slime mold, but I, I put collaboration very much in inverted commas, very well aware that the organism wasn't exactly choosing to work with me. Um, that you know, the, the honest description is probably closer to benevolent slavery, that I'm, you know, I'm using the organism or employing the organism to, uh, to perform, to you know, kind of present, but it, you know, I, I see it was with good intentions of, to you know, increase understanding of that organism and therefore appreciation of it. Um, you know, we can we can never uh, cross those kind of species uh, divides. Um, so you know, I can never really commune with the slime mold. It's always going to be utterly ambivalent and indifferent and ignorant of my existence which I quite like the fact that you know, there's a lot of human curiosity about these organisms and the organisms, we, you know, we, we do not matter. We don't, we don't figure in their, 
in their thinking. Um, so yes, it's I think it's a it's a complex relationship. But I do, you know, I really do try to look after the organisms that I'm working with and and you know, even if I'm interrupting them or taking them out of context and um I'm you know trying to put them back and be respectful and and feed them and look after them well. There is a duty of care. Heather and I recently drove up with some students to Northumberland and we, we arrived at the place we're staying and it was full of rabbits. And I, I remember you shouting out, oh, rabbits, with uh, so much affection. <laughs> uh, yeah, there is, you know, I think there is an affection building up in the work. And I wondered in a way how important that affection is for you, Andrew, in your work. I mean, you speak quite passionately, but is there room for this kind of affection in Forestry England? I don't think we'd be doing our jobs with, yeah. without it. We're civil servants. We're not particularly well paid or anything. Mm. So uh, we, we have to do it for a passion for the work. So I've mm. certainly got a passion for wildlife and, mm. and love to be connected with nature and feel that connection and also envisioning that kind of opportunity for nature. Mm. And I think that's true of, of lots of roles within my organisation. So whether you're passionate about wildlife, whether you're passionate just about growing trees and about producing wonderful uh, timber for the low carbon economy, or if you're just passionate about getting people engaged with nature and, and mm. out into our woodlands. There's, there's always, yeah, there's always a love for something other than humanity. Mm. Great, we have a question. Thank you. I, I didn't want to say you're not passionate. I, I, I can feel the passion. I, I just sometimes wondering, working through big institutions, it becomes quite procedural. And I feel that motivation is quite crucial as a driver. Um, so um, uh, Catalina, would you like to speak up or do you want me to read it out? I can I can try. It's a bit windy from here, from where I am. Uh, uh, but yeah, thank you both, Andrew and Heather. It was really great to hear you, you about your work. Um, I wondered, Andrew, if you could maybe expand a little bit on like the difference that you see between the forestry England strategy of wilding and what is now like understood as rewilding, like the discourse on rewilding. And and I had a question for both: is how much control. Um, you have over your projects and how much is, I mean, to what extent is that desirable or not? Um, yeah, just those questions, thank you. Yeah, really good questions. So um, rewilding is a spectrum and it's a term that is extremely broad. And at one end of the spectrum, rewilding has been used for just letting go, for non-intervention, for doing nothing. Um, and that's certainly an approach you can take. I think through my talk, I was really trying to illustrate that in the UK at least, it's not a mechanism we want to use because it can have negative impacts overall for biodiversity, which is our, which our headline goal. And the reason is because they're missing natural processes. So we've got a lovely uh, national nature reserve called Lady Park Wood in the Forest of Dean, where we've taken that approach. We've just done hands off. What happens when you do nothing? You just fence an area off. And what happens is that the canopy closes, you get lots of deadwood, loads of great fungi, but because of the canopy closure, because we're not reinstating that natural process of disturbance, uh, the, the, the amount of flora, so, so woodland flora, woodland flowers in that site is terrible. There's hardly any because it's such a dark system. So wonderful for some species, not wonderful for others. And we're trying, really trying to uh, uh, get the balance right there. At the other end of the spectrum of the rewilding spectrum is the heavily interventionist. And I think we're probably at that end in terms of Forestry England's approach, which we hope complements uh, many other approaches. We're not saying it's the right one, it's just one that, that, that suits our, our culture, I think. And that's one where we want to reinstate these natural processes, be very interventionist, get them to a state where they can be more self-sustaining, more self-willed, definitely. But ultimately, we do, we do accept that we want them to be economic. And that's, for instance, where we diverged from rewilding Britain, where it was just a small divergence where we wanted to take timber out of these sites because if we can make them more economical, it means we can do far more of them. Whereas rewilding Britain, more purist approach saying actually to maximize biodiversity, get 100% rather than just 80 or 90% that we're going for, um, you wouldn't extract timber, you'd leave all that as dead wood and get this wonderful fungi number. So a real balancing of approaches. Um, there's another kind of uh, uh, axis, I suppose, on that spectrum, which is looking to the past or looking to the future. So a lot of rewilding is looking to the past and trying to recreate this very specific ecosystem from the past, often a Pleistocene ecosystem, a pre-glacial uh, ecosystem. I think we have to look to the future. So that's just another place where we are on the spectrum. 
climate change changes everything in terms of species distribution across the world. And I think we really have to look forward not only to climate change, but future diseases, future invasive species, and really ask ourselves, what is a resilient future ecosystem rather than trying to recreate an ecosystem from the past? So yeah, lots of spectrums on rewilding. That's, I think that's yeah, where forestry in Leeds sits. I'd like to follow on from that um, because yeah, it's, it, it's I, I find it curious that the, that the rewilding term that is as if we can go back to anything, and you know maybe it should be pre-wilding that we are you know, trying to just create the conditions for uh, habitats to restore and balance themselves for the, you know, the changing environmental conditions. Um, yeah, and be, you know, as things are constantly in flux and, and changing, I think yeah, the, the, there's really interesting questions around intervention and control. And I think it relates to the second part of the question of, you know, are you just kind of nudging a system? Or, you know, is there kind of quite a radical reintroduction of a species that's going to you know have quite a big domino effect? Is it, you know, yeah, is it then sort of just kind of tweaking and and shifting things? Um, and you know we're operating in very different scales with you know different different remits, but I think there is that you know kind of observing and intervening and observing and 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 it is a slow process and it's one where you're you know you're learning from the living systems and and responding to so it's very much about feedback loops I think um, I'll say something about control and then maybe you want to say something about the control thing um, I mean I recognise that you know working with living systems you know they have their own subjective uh you know realities and and you know kind of function and, and motivations um that i'm trying to understand and intervene with so i can't control any of the outcomes um and i greatly enjoy that lack of control so i think you know where the kind of artistic you know, creation or building or design comes in is in the creating the conditions for something to happen. So, you know, I, I know enough about the organisms to understand what kind of environment they need, what they will respond positively or negatively to in terms of stimulants or, you know, kind of attractants, repellents. Um, and I can kind of construct an environment within which I think they will do something interesting um, or within which I can learn, you know, how they respond to a particular so the, the attention goes on creating the conditions and then stepping back and seeing what happens. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm always surprised by the outcomes. And that's, I think, part of the motivation. I don't want to control what comes out of it, but there's a lot of consideration that goes, what goes into it. Really interesting. Just coming on, sorry, Andres, is that right? Go for it, yeah. Go yeah. For it. Uh, just on the control question, um, I loved your example, Heather, of um, lady, lady, uh, ladybirds as a predator of aphids, and then getting the hose out now and then, just when you think over aphid numbers are too high. And we do exactly the same thing with deer, which can be controversial, because we've got no predator community of deer in the UK. We're missing not only lynx, wolves, and bears, but a variety of extinct cats and uh, cave bears and the like that would have naturally capped that deer population. So that's where we say, well, we have to step in and reinstate that and replicate that missing natural process. Um, and we step in and we, we try to do predator, predator con uh, control and all that. In terms of ethics, we, we try and make sure that all of that goes into the food chain. Like wild meat is a key part of the products from our, from our estate. Um, but it's a really interesting question about what level of control do you want? And all we know is we know the, we know the boundaries. We know that we, what's bad and what's good so that we know a hyperabundance of deer can really smash a woodland so nothing really grows there and eventually that population of deer would get so high that they'd, they'd eat all their food resource and then die and you'd have starvations as we've seen at the Ustada Pass in, in, in the Netherlands. So we know that, 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 that that's too high but we know what's too low. Uh, we know that we want deer in our landscapes and we want them to be part of a functioning ecosystem and then there's this huge range where they're absolutely fine so it's kind of our control that says we don't want these extremes but within this range absolutely fine so they can be self-willed as they want to be um, but really yeah, yeah really interesting question um Thank you so much. There are a few questions coming in in the chat. Um, maybe Catalina, can I just to close this loop? Do you want to quickly uh, come back in and just? No, no, it's fine. We can leave yeah. open for the, for the questions. Thank All you, right. thank you both. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. 
And Phil, would you, I think it's a quite good uh, question on ethics and power. Would you, would you like to kind of ask that in person? Yeah, nice. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, and hi, Heather. Nice to see you. Hi, Phil. Um, um, yeah, I, I'm really, I mean, it's really exciting that finally sort of rewilding whatever term you want to use is actually seriously on the agenda and there are starting to be real, real examples of it happening after many, many years of, of sort of um, tiptoeing around the edges. But we're still fundamentally in a situation where the agriculturalists are there to grow food and to make money and the property developers are there to make money. Um, and, and so there's the power relationships in all of this. We've been talking about the power relations between the other than human and the human, but there's also between those who want to try and rebuild eco ecosystems and, and to support that process and those who still see it as a resource to be exploited. And there's a long way to go on that, not just that debate, but on the practice of it. As somebody, I live in Manchester and you know we're fighting developers in our conservation area and in the park, trying to take bits of the park and so on. So, so it's, I'm just very interested. It's, it is a system, isn't it? But it's an economic and social system as well as a natural system that we're talking about and the interactions. Don't have any answers. I think it's great that, um, thank you both for, you know, what you're doing. Um, but somehow if it's to become anything other than another form of farming, it's it's got to be, somehow we've got to broker better understanding and, and different priorities. It's not really a question, I suppose, but it's a no. discussion. <laughs> Happy to put some thoughts out, Andreas, if that's right. Yes, please. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a really good one, Phil, because fundamentally, when we talk about, I mean, the UK and English landscape, we're looking at a landscape which is driven by economics. So we look back at even ancient woodland in England is entirely economic uh, a, a produce of an economic system of its time. So ancient woodland is a hazel coppice, usually with oak or, uh, overstory, hazel coppiced for product, for, for producing that product. So it's a key industry of its time, ancient woodland. And, and as, you, as you rightly point out today, um, we're very in a very similar place. So there's two options. You either work against that economic system and you say, for instance, many countries have, here is a national park of public land and this is going to be for nature. And that's so that, that completely circumvents that economic system, or you try and work with that economic system and say, here is a parcel of land that delivers not just for nature, but also delivers monetary gain or delivers for people. And we're trying to currently do that latter. So in a variety of ways, the world is getting quite exciting in that we're trying to mix rewilding with timber. We think that's there's not a lot of conflicts there. It's not going to be perfect for biodiversity, but it's going to be hopefully extremely good. Um, we're also really interested in those ecosystem services that can be delivered by nature. So it's a really controversial topic, monetizing nature, about, for instance, monetizing the value that nature can have, for instance, for carbon sequestration or for um, flood prevention or for um, uh, you know, offsetting nutrients in other sites. But um, there's also things like corporate selling uh, and really wanting to be nature positive. And engaging with corporate partnerships in saying, uh, you know, they want to invest in sustainable systems. So that they can invest, for instance, in rewilding. And that, that's far more preferable to than investing in oil and gas. So I don't think there is a perfect answer. We've currently got a very imperfect system that we're trying to work with in terms of an economic point. You could get argue that government should step in and, and just completely circumvent the system and say this natural national park is just for nature, which have been happened. Um, and we're trying a different, very, very different approach. But yeah. Economic has, economics has been the fundamental driver of our landscapes for millennia. So I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. I think I'd like to respond by sharing a story which relates to um, something Andreas mentioned earlier. So we recently took a group of students from architecture and from art and science um, courses to um, Allen Heads, which is the highest village in England up in Northumberland. Um, it's and you know, as, as we came off the motorway, we were in a minibus, came off the motorway into the Pennines, and there was just this kind of relaxation of, oh, 
coming in, we were in a rural environment, everything all is well in the world. We've left the city behind us. We've left the motorway behind us. Um, and then the joy of seeing lots of bunny rabbits. Um, so we thought, you know, we were in a, we were in a natural, beautiful, natural place. But spending time in that natural place, you realise it's not natural at all. And it is you know, completely constructed through human intervention over time. Um, Allen Heads is, is built, it's a village that was built to support the lead mining industry. Um, it, you know, that village only exists for that, that historical uh, context. It's the most expensive grouse shooting land in the country. Um, and so you, you, you start to notice the scarification from them managing the, the heathland uh, to encourage you know, uh, green shoots to feed the grouse to get people to shoot them at great expense. Um, and so, you know, the, and, and the, the, you know, the knock on effect of biodiversity. So the landowners that want to protect their, their grouse populations to maximize their shooting profits, take out the predators, the natural predators of the grouse. So there are no foxes, no badgers, no birds of prey in that area. And then that has a knock on effect, hence the many, many bunny rabbits, because it, they're also the predators of the, of the rabbits. Um, so you can really see, it's, you know, very much in, in front of you, the, the impact of that, the economic, the relationship between economic drive and biodiversity and how, that, how the land is shaped over time. Um, and it was, yeah, it was really important learning for all of us to spend time in that kind of environment and to understand those, those histories and those impacts past, present and future. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very conscious that forestry England has to generate like a lot of the income. I think up to 80% is something like that figure. And I'm also aware that I think you changed slightly your mission from mainly being a timber producer to also being a provider for biodiversity. So I think you're sitting on that threshold of that debate of how do we value, what values do we apply and, and how do we value it kind of while having to self fund quite quite a lot. So it would be quite interesting to hear more about it. I know Elena is coming, she's talking about the natural capital approach, but also to hear a little bit from you where the maybe the opportunities are to introduce different values. That's why I was asking about affection, <laughs> but we are talking about students building empathy and where, where do these values start to count within that system? I would be quite interested to know. Oh, really, yeah, really good question. I'm great you got Ellie Chuka me on. She's fantastic. So we can talk more about our natural capital approach. Just very briefly as an introduction to that. Yeah, the Forestry Act set, us up in, set the Forestry Commission up in 1919, really to produce a, a, a source of timber for the nation um, with timber as its overall focus. And we've very much moved away from that now to say, how do we deliver what the nation needs, not just timber? So what are the public goods that we can provide? And we frame that through natural capital, trying to develop, develop a model to, to deliver and maximize ecosystem services. So everything from flood prevention to carbon to connection with nature, with biodiversity through to timber as well. So trying to get that, that multi-purpose decision-making. Uh, it's very difficult. So Ellie's got a huge brain, so she's an excellent <laughs> person to be leading on that. Great, um, that's, that's on the 15th of June for anyone who's interested, yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah, there's a really interesting question there about connecting people with nature and diversity and inclusion as well comes into that heavily because fundamentally, Forestry and the National Trust, we only appeal to a very small subset of society. And I'm going down a rabbit hole here, but it's, it's, it's fundamentally something we've got to address. We have to, uh, we have to reach all aspects of society. We can't just, uh, you know... Uh, be available to people who are able to drive to our woodlands. My first slide was all about driving, you know, and loads of people don't have access to a front vehicle. Um, where our woodlands do need to be in places that are accessible and that can develop that, that deep connection, hopefully with our landscapes, forests and nature, because you can get so much value from it, both uh, intrinsic, but also value in terms of your health and well-being. We know as we're engaging closely with the NHS that, that GPs should be prescribing a walk in the woods. It's far more cost-effective than a lot of drugs out there. Um, so uh, we're really um, hoping to kind of explore that more as well, those kind of opportunities for health, well-being and access. And connection. Thank you. There's one more question from Jess, who is in a very noisy room, and I read it out. 
uh, on her behalf. I'm currently working on a project about designing interventions for humans to coexist with beavers. I'm struggling to find existing interventions for a source of inspiration. Could you recommend some I could look into? Heather, have you worked with beavers? I haven't worked with beavers, but a, a book that comes to mind that I would be really enjoyable and I think throughout really interesting questions is Being a Beast by Charles Foster. Um, so it's a, a book that's very readable, very funny, but he's it's a, a, an account of his experiments over the years of trying to engage with the subjective reality of other species. So he tries to be a badger, he tries to be a swift, he tries to be a deer, a fox and an otter. So that's as close as you get to the beavers is it's, it's an otter. Um, and it's a combination of nature writing, practical philosophy, journalism, um, and it's a very, very good read. And I think if you're trying, if you're working on a project which is looking at this kind of coexistence and, you know, the, the limitations and possibilities of how humans can meaningfully, kind of empathically engage with other species, it's a joy to read. That's my recommendation. That's great. I've got a far more practical and boring one, I'm afraid, uh, called The Beaver Management Handbook, written by Rasheen and uh, uh, Campbell Parnama, who's fantastic, a Scottish ecologist, as well as uh, some Norwegian colleagues. Um, I'll post a link to the chat. It's far more practical and uh, interventionist, but hopefully those two sound like a great balance. Thank you so much. Yeah, do please put it in the chat. Um... Um, yeah, I think that's our time. Thank you so much, both of you. That's been hugely enjoyable. And um, I'm very much looking forward to next week's talk with Matteo, because the way it's a continuation and the kind of side maybe from the Colombian rainforest with, uh, as Catalina mentions, where it's kind of different discourse and different kind of sensitivities. Um, so yeah, if you have time, please come back next week. I thank you both so much. And thank you all for being here. And the talk will be on the website very soon for those who missed it. Uh, brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Heather. Thank you very Absolute much. Absolute pleasure. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.